gloria a Jesús. Él no tenía por qué estar entre nosotros porque nosotros no podíamos tener niños. Dos años a mi esposa y profetizó a Paolo un año antes. Sabíamos que él venía y que iba a servir a Jesús. Vamos a orar, tira tu mano. Padre, te doy gracias por la vida de mi hijo, Señor. Te doy gracias por todo lo bueno que él ha traído a nuestras vidas. Y te pido, Señor, que él verme a él, Paolo, 100%, de por basura todo lo que aprendió esos años en la universidad, Señor. Para que sea el corazón de Paolo y tú en sí. Y merme al 100% para que sea simple un vaso trayendo tu palabra al corazón de los hombres en esta mañana. Yo lo cubro con la sangre de Cristo, de la mollera de su cabeza hasta la planta de sus pies. Y te doy gracias por él, en el nombre poderoso de Jesús. Amén. Antes de que empezamos, todos lo que necesitan traducción porque voy a predicar en inglés. Entonces todos, todos ya tienen algo. Ah, Rosy, thank you so much. Trust me, I know what it's like to be a translator, and it is not fun. <laughs> so, you're the real MVP. <laughs> Only English speakers will get that. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> Alright, good stuff. So, uh, before we actually start, like, for the young people, if you are graduating, like, within the next couple of years, and you're still thinking about where to go, you're not sure exactly what you want to do with your life, what career or school you want to pursue, I do recommend spending at least one year, uh, at least one year, just for, not really for the credentials, because it's not accredited, unfortunately, but just for the environment and the spiritual, you really do feel a difference. Like, my mom actually came for, uh, for a one-thing conference, which is always between Christmas and New Year's. And eventually she told me that as she entered the prayer room, which we're required to go to for a certain amount of time every day, you could just feel this tangible difference. It's an entire community, so yeah, think about it. If you guys have any questions, you can just come up to me afterwards. Alright. So here's the thing. At IHOP, and just that whole Christian environment, I had to learn a language that I didn't even know that I knew. Christianese. It's something we say in English among North American and probably also British Christians. Terms from the Bible, just from church. Things that we say as Christians on a regular basis and we just assume that everyone else, even if they are not a Christian, they will know what it means. And even within the church, because I grew up in the church, since as far as I can remember, I grew up in very charismatic, Holy Spirit-filled Holy Spirit -filled churches. And that's why the whole idea behind, you know, the presence of God coming and raising your hands and prophecy and healing and deliverance, that, none of that was ever weird to me, because I just grew up in that. And I had to alert, especially when I left my Christian school, which was also a part of my Christian education, and go to a public school for the last three years of my high school, I had to realize that not everyone is going to understand what I say. And so, even within the body of Christ, young people particularly, we just throw terms around here and there and we say things, not because we believe it, because in order to believe you must understand. You, you may want to believe it, for example, Uh, I remember uh, last summer I was trying to teach you guys a little bit about Christian apologetics. And out of all of the most fundamental parts of Christianity, probably the Trinity is the hardest for us to understand. You believe it, or at least you want to believe it, the concept of, you know, the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit are one God. And yet, you don't really understand it. I didn't understand it until I was about maybe 17, 18 years old. Before then, I believed it, but it was just something that I took by faith. It's like, okay, I have no idea how to explain this to a non-Christian, but somehow, we, I still believe that there is one God, that the Father in heaven is God, that God became incarnate in Jesus Christ, and He is also fully God, and now, after the cross, we have the Holy Spirit that abides within us, and He is also God. I didn't know how to explain that or even why I believed it, but I just did. Because scripture said so. It said that there was one God, and yet Jesus Christ accepted worship, and then when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit, they felt dead because they had violated God himself. And here's the thing. 
during my time at IHOP, the idea of the Trinity and relationship, salvation, the indwelling or abiding, these are things that I have heard all my life. And yet today, what I want to do, and before I get into that, guys, I know you guys are not going to carry your Bibles everywhere, but seriously, just download the app. It's free. Trust me, I'm Jewish. I love free things. Just download it for free. Carry it with you. And if you ever see me like this, I'm not on Facebook, I promise. I'm on the Bible app. <laughs> uh, you, uh, if you guys do have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. I'm not going to read it just yet, but I know for some of you it takes a little while to get there. I understand. It's a small book. But here's the thing. I had to understand not only what the Trinity was, but what the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, want. Because what we often forget is that God, the Bible says God is spirit, and we associate that with something that is impersonal. Something that we cannot relate to, or understand, or feel, you know, sympathize with that. But the reality is that the only reason why we humans love we desire friendship and fellowship and closeness with one another is because those attributes are first and foremost found within God Himself, within the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, even before time. Only in the Christian worldview, love gives birth to creation. In every other worldview, where you have just one single God, He is dependent on creation in order to love, in order to have fellowship. For example, I was listening to, uh, on YouTube, some Muslim apologists about their faith, and I try to be fair, I give other worldviews and philosophies and religions a chance to explain their view of God. And this uh, Muslim apologist, I forget his name, it's like some Arabic word or something, he said that the reason why God created was because he was lonely. Yes, you heard that correctly, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this up. God felt so lonely that he created the angels to worship him and mankind and the earth and everything in it to, you know, to have fellowship. So therefore, to the Muslim, I would say that then that is an argument against God's self-sufficiency. In other words, he is not enough in and of himself. He is dependent on creation if he wants to love or show affection. Only within the Christian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is love, unity, and fellowship before us. And He does not need us. The Trinity was there before time, space, and matter. Some of you guys need to know, what is the very first verse of the Bible? Young people, the first verse of the Bible. Louder. In the beginning. Okay, in the beginning, good. Good, good. Someone read the first verse of the Bible. Great! <laughs> That's an improvement for most Christians. In the beginning time, God created, that's energy, the heavens, space, and the earth, matter. Any physicist will tell you that those are the four components to everything that exists in our universe. But that was all in the beginning. So before then, there was who? God. When Moses asked the Lord, well, when I go to the people of Israel and I, and I tell them, well, God spoke to me, they're like, well, okay, then what is his name? Who is he? God simply says, I am. You know, I was, I, I'm going to be, I'm right here right now, I just am. Before time, space, matter, and energy, I am. And after time, space, matter, and energy, after this earth is completely destroyed, I am. He just is. Within the Trinity, I, this is what, something I learned out I have, in case what you're wondering. Uh, who here watched The Shack? The movie, The Shack. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, I don't know when it's going to be on Netflix or whatever you guys use these days. I, I grew up in the era of uh, VHS, for those of you that are ancient enough to remember that. But you guys have to watch it. Obviously, it's not the perfect image of the Trinity. There are some flaws here and there. But it's the closest I've seen to a picture of God that desires fellowship. Because before then, especially, you know, in medieval art, for example, you have Michelangelo as the creation where you see God is like this and Adam is like this. God is always the single, bearded, almost Santa Claus looking figure in the sky. And we do not relate to him in any way. And yet the creator, well, the writer of the shack, 
painted God while the father has a loving black woman that was just like, mm -hmm. I just wanted to love you so much. And this thing is, like, what is this? Even for me, I was skeptical when I first saw the shack, like, what is this? Why, why would you want to portray God like this? But by the end of the movie, I was crying with the rest of the theater because it just touches your heart so much in such a unique way. But the reality is that even though the word Trinity is not found in Scripture, Jesus beautifully reveals it in a way that even I had not noticed before. Uh, if you grew up in the church, you'll be familiar with these three parables of Jesus. And you can look them up in your Bibles if you want to. I'm not going to read from it. Uh, from Luke chapter 15. This is the only time in the Gospels where Jesus tells three parables in a row that even as different as they are, they all proclaim the same message. The first one, he says to the Pharisees who are questioning him, because what triggered them, what triggered him to tell these parables, the Pharisees were complaining, saying, this man is eating with tax collectors and sinners. If he claims to be a holy man, he would stay as far as possible from these people. Jesus, why are you with these people? And so in response, Jesus says, which one of you if you have a hundred sheep, and yet you only count ninety-nine, will you not leave the ninety-nine that are safe to go look for that one? And when you find that one that was lost, you pick that sheep up on your shoulders and you take it home, care for its wounds and whatever else it needs. Who wouldn't do that? Is that does a sheep matter nothing to you just because it's one? The crowd was silent. And then to the women he said, what about you if you lose a silver coin? There was a lady that had ten, but she lost one, and so what she did? She lit a small lamp and swept all over the house until she found that coin. And in both cases, when, when the shepherd and when this woman with the lamp found what they were looking for, they called all of their friends from the neighborhood and said, Come, rejoice with me, because what was once lost has not been found. Share my joy. So, so far we have a shepherd, and we have light and fire. And in the third parable we have a father. I don't know if this is starting to sink in a little bit. Who is the shepherd? You're allowed to answer. Jesus, he said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. Who is the light? Who is the fire that came on Pentecost? The Holy Spirit. So Jesus, in a very subtle way, and I love it, I'm like, dude, you're a freaking Jesus. He perfectly summarizes how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are actively pursuing us and are overjoyed when we do come to Him. And each time, He says in Luke 15 that there is more rejoicing in heaven with the angels over one sinner who repents. And obviously you guys all know the story of the part of the Son, where the Son asks for His inheritance, the Father doesn't argue with Him, just says, alright, here you go. And the son wastes all of his money on vanity until he is completely <laughs> broke and there's a famine that hits the land. He has no job, he has no money, he has no food. And so as a Jew, he has to do the most disgraceful thing he can do and that is feed pigs, which are unclean. And finally he snaps out of it, comes to his senses and he says, I had everything with my father. Even the servants of my father are living better than me right now. And I know that I'm no longer worthy to be called his son. And so, this is my plan. I will go to my father, and I will beg him for forgiveness, and if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, he will let me be one of his servants. Because I know I, I'm not a son anymore. I, I rebelled against him. I, I took what was mine at the wrong time, and I wasted it on things that my father would be ashamed of. Why would he ever want to receive me again? And yet, for some reason, just seeing the silhouette in the horizon of his son, this old man runs, probably for the first time in years, to his son, embraces him, and doesn't even let him finish the sentence before the scripture says, he put new sandals on his feet, which represented he's putting him back to work. He put a robe around his neck, signifying royalty, and a ring, signifying the inheritance is still yours. You are still my son. And after I die, you're still going to get this property. Fully restored sonship. And so what, is, what does Paul tell us about this now? We finally go to Ephesians. I want to start uh, here with, uh, let's see, verse 
15. It says right here, uh, the reason why I wanted to start here is because the focus is going to be in chapter 2, but I love to read in context. Therefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord, he's talking to the church, and your love of the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you. Make mention of your prayers, that God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. So God wants us to know Him and understand Him and everything He is. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, that are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. So what's God's desire? God's desire is for us not only to be reconciled to Him, but to reign with Him. You guys all know salvation. If I ask you what salvation is in a sentence, what would you say? Any, any of the young people, or any of the adults too, if you understand what I'm saying. Grace. Is there a hand? <laughs> a free gift. A free gift, that's good. But what is salvation like? What happens in salvation? I think that's a better way to put it. What exactly happens in salvation? Come on, you guys are on YouTube, so you better... <laughs> I didn't pray for everyone. That's a good way to put it. Very good. So we often see, you know, from life to death, from slavery to freedom, and we get this idea, like this dual picture of the idea of how if we are in sin and we do not receive Christ, we will go to hell. If we receive Christ and we have His righteousness, we go to heaven. And that's true. There's nothing wrong with that, and it is true. The reason why I became a Christian is because I was scared of hell, as most of us should be. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But there's something else that in the church we are missing so much, and it is a revelation that God wants so desperately to tell us, because it will inspire us even more than the fear of hell to pursue after Him. The inheritance of His glory. And I'll keep reading here which he worked in Christ when he rose him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. So after Jesus went to the cross and rose from the dead, there is now this continuation of the Trinity. Imagine yourself a little bit of a triangle. The Father in creation desired fellowship, and that is why he created man. We have in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was without form and dark, and the Spirit of God was moving over the waters. And then verse 3 says, And God has said, Let there be light. So we have the Father who creates because He desires fellowship. The Spirit moves when the Word, remember it says, God said, God said the Word. By Him all things were made. God the Son speaks. Look, the Father desires, the Son speaks. And because the Son speaks, the Holy Spirit moves and acts upon the earth. In salvation, the Father desired reconciliation with us because of sin. So the Son became incarnate, and He died for us on the cross. He rose from the dead, and He said, it is finished. And if anyone believes in Me, he will have eternal life. And so to every believer who receives that gift, the Spirit now moves and dwells with him. The Trinity is in full sync and function in the work of salvation. And we are seated, sorry, He is seated in heavenly places. And what God desires is for us to be seated with Him. Check this out. It says, Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age which is to come. And He has put all things under His feet and given to Him to be head over all things of the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fulfills it all. And then finally, chapter 2. And you, He made alive, who were dead in your trespasses and sin. Just like you said. We were once dead, and now He has made us alive. In which you once walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit who works in the sense of disobedience. Because when Adam and Eve sinned, what happened, other than just spiritual death, is that the dominion that God had given Adam and Eve over the earth, they had forfeited it, and by default, it was given to Satan. And so at the cross, 
Jesus took that dominion away from him and now wants to give it back to us. Amen. Among whom also, once, we conducted ourselves in the lusts of our own flesh, fulfilling our own desires and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. What does that mean? It means that when we, when Adam and Eve uh, forfeited their dominion over the earth, they also forfeited their sonship to God. They, they said, I don't want you. You know, we think of the sin in Genesis chapter 3 about all oh, they ate an apple. That was not the sin. Look at this. If Satan wanted to tempt them with food, he would have just said, well, aren't you hungry? Just like with Jesus back in Luke chapter 4. Yeah, Jesus had been fasting in the wilderness for 40 days. And he said, are you not the son of God? Well, why don't you turn all these stones into bread? But he didn't tempt Adam and Eve like that. He said, you will not die if you eat this. God is hiding something from you because God knows that when you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that suddenly became attractive to them. The idea that I can be my own God. I don't have to submit to his rules. I don't have to be, you know, under his, his leadership and his authority. I don't have to do what he says. I decide what is right or wrong. I have dominion, so I can do what I want. The rules are for me and me only. Whatever he says is irrelevant to me. But in that process of the fall, mankind, and each and every single one of us, defaulted our status as sons of God. And because of that, we became, as it says right here, children of wrath, destined for judgment. Because if you are not in God's presence, you will be destroyed. We were created for fellowship. That is why those that are not in Christ are constantly looking for something that they will never find. Even St. Augustine said, My heart is restless until it finds its rest in you, Lord. But God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which was he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means now, remember the formula? He desires, the, the Father desires, the Son speaks, and the Holy Spirit moves. Now you're here. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So now I think you better watch what you're praying, because when you are complaining to God, He is listening and He just desires to hear from you. If you read uh, Revelation chapter 4, the description that John gives about the throne room of heaven, that is where you are. The elders and the angels are holding those bowls of incense, which are going up, the prayers of the saints unto the Lord. You're in that. And you, all of your complaints, and all of your, and all your tragedies, and the sins you committed, that is all going up to the Lord. And yet you think that your prayers are relevant. But the Father desires to hear from you even when you are at your worst and you're doing nothing but complaining. He hears that. And because at the sound of your voice, you have now the authority that Christ has as the Son of God. And now the Holy Spirit moves. That is the reason why when we are in right standing with God and we ask for His presence to come, He gives it willingly. When the sinner repents and says, God, I need you. I need your rightnesses. I repent of all my sins. The Holy Spirit now abides with there is power, and Christ is given to you at the cross. That in the age to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. You guys hear me say this verse all the time. And that it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God hath prepared beforehand that we should walk in Him. Let's skip down to verse 14. For He Himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one, who has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, that is, the law of the commandments that was contained in the ordinances, as talking about the Old Testament, as to create in Himself one new man, from the two. And he made peace and he reconciled us both to God through the cross. And he put death to that separation. Wow. For through him, verse 18, we have both access by one spirit to the Father. 
Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Let that sink in for a second. All right, let's continue. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple of the Lord, in whom you are also being built together as a dwelling place for God in the Spirit. Complete changes your perspective about what it means to be saved. Oh, well, I was saved from hell. I was rescued. Yes. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Yes, you were. But what about this? You were an orphan. You were not only an orphan, you were an enemy of God. You were a child of wrath. And yet God, in His infinite mercy, became one of you. And He took your punishment that every traitor deserved, separation from God. And now, because of what He did, He not only forgives you and reconciles you, He puts that ring on your finger. And He puts that robe around you. And He says, I don't, I don't just want to be friends. I want you to be my son. I want you to be my daughter. I want you to share in my inheritance. If Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, if God is the King of the universe, what does that, if, and if he's adopted you as his sons and daughters, what does that make you? You guys are killing me here, seriously. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. Yeah, sons and daughters, but if you're a son and daughter of the king, what does that make you? Princess. Prince and princesses, thank you. I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> So, you know, what do we do with this? How else do you respond to a God like that, who is not only willing to forgive you, but to place you next to Jesus Christ? Because the time is coming when Jesus will take this world by force. Something you guys have to remember, Jesus already came as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But he is now coming back as a lion to execute perfect justice. And you only have two options. Either the cross stands before you and your sins are forgiven, His righteousness is given to you and you can stand with full confidence as a son of God, or you pay for your own sins. But what God will not do as a righteous judge is overlook sin. He will not just sweep your sin under the rug and say, well, that's okay, just, just go and sin no more. He will deal with sin, and if you are not in right standing with God, if you don't understand your position as a son and daughter of God, when God annihilates the world of evil, you're going to be part of that. And he's going to have to take you with it. He doesn't desire that. He desires that all men be saved, the scripture tells us. And that's why he made it possible through the cross. But how do you respond to that? Well, I'll leave you with this one last thing. You guys know the story about how the Pharisees were always trying to trap Jesus with all these different like trick questions. And yet Jesus was always able to... Just shut them all down. There's even a point in the Gospel of John that made me laugh when I read it. It said that after he responded to the Sadducees, it says, and, no, and from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. I love that. It's like, like turn down for what? You know? The young generation will get that. There's this one place where uh, they bring uh, you know, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they want to trap Jesus into committing treason against the Roman Emperor. And so they say, uh, Teacher, uh, tell us, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Why was this a trap? Because if he said, yes, it is right, the people would turn against him because the people hated Rome. But if he said, no, it's not right, then he would be uh, guilty of treason against the Roman Empire, and then they had a legitimate reason to have him arrested and executed. And Jesus responds with, why are you trying to trap me, you hypocrites? And you're going to see why he calls them hypocrites in a second. He said, show me our silver coins. So, you know, that pulls out his quarter. And he says, and it's on our coins too. We have Queen Elizabeth. But on the Roman coins, he says, whose image do you see on here? And they said, well, Caesar's, obviously. He says, so render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. None of you know this? Seriously? <laughs> this is much easier than I know. <laughs> and give to God the things that are God's. You know, we read that for the first time, you're like, uh, okay, cool. What's the significance of that? What was it like for Jews to hear this? Why did Jesus call them hypocrites? Like, what was so hypocritical about them? Well, think about this. And this is a food for thought I want you to leave here with. 
The reason why that coin belonged to Caesar was because the image of Caesar was on it. What has the image of God and therefore belongs to God? Food, food for thought. Exactly, that's why he said, you hypocrites, because these people were so concerned about their self-righteousness and their laws and their customs that they were not giving themselves up to God. Jesus looks at them and says, you hypocrites. The same way how you have to give this coin to Caesar because it has his image on it, you have to give it to him because it's the right thing to do, you're under his authority. Well, guess what? God has placed his image upon you. So which of you is giving yourself to God? Which of you is submitting to his rulership and acknowledging the fact that he wants to bring you forth as a son? And through the cross, He has made you right, He has justified you, and sanctified you. It is His will for you, and this is the reason why you were created. If you want to live your own way, that's fine. But this is God's will. And if you will submit to it, you will find life. Amen. Amen.